Every time we come together, we ought to ask God to bless us and to help us as we open up the Bible. So as we always have done, let's bow our heads and ask God to be with us tonight. Father in heaven, we want to thank you again that we can come together and open up your word, that your word is a lamp, you say, unto our pathway. It lights our understanding. And tonight, Lord, we just pray again that you just be here. Give us the Spirit of God in our mind and heart that we might know your will and all the various understandings of some of these things happening as the world and as your coming appears. We thank you so much for what you're doing, and we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We have come through quite a uh, century. 20th century has been unbelievable, especially when it comes to warfare and strife, the atrocities, the unbelievable horrors that we have experienced just in the 20th century. Yet the Bible does talk about a time in which there will be a thousand years in which Satan will be bound, in which this world will know sin no more. And tonight we want to talk and see what the Bible has to say about this Revelations prophecy which predicts the 1,000 years when Satan is bound. Let's go to the chapter dealing with this. It's found in Revelation chapter 20, starting with the very first verse. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And they threw him into the abyss, so that he should not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. You begin to see here, it's talking about a thousand year period. Now what is interesting, some people use the word millennium as a, a substitute, so to speak, for this thousand years. Sometimes you'll talk to a Christian, they'll talk about the millennium. We're not talking about, you know, what happened just a few years ago, Y2K, you know, from the nine, 1999 to 2000 with the change of the millennium. That's what we're talking about. This is a thousand year period in the future that God has delegated as a time in which Satan is bound and chained and actually thrown into a great chasm or a great abyss, the Bible says. Now the word millennium, you'll never find it in the Bible because it comes from two Latin words, milli thousand annum years. You put millianum, millianum is millennium. You put that together and you come up with thousand years. So in the course of our study tonight, I might refer to the millennium or thousand years. I just want to make sure everybody knows we're talking about the same period of time. Now, what does the Bible say as far as the beginning of this thousand years? When does it start? The Bible has some fascinating things to say about this, and I want to continue in Revelation 20 starting with verse 6, because it does give us a hint when these thousand years begin. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the, what's the next couple of words there? First resurrection. Now, we've already studied about that. We've studied that on at least a couple of nights. Last time we were together, we studied it. In fact, we looked at it the other night when we were talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. So we have a good idea what the first resurrection is all about. It's the saved that have given their life to Jesus Christ throughout all ages. They are resurrected when Jesus comes back the second time. Now it goes on. On such, in other words, the ones that come forth in the first resurrection, on such the second death. Now, we haven't talked about that. We haven't learned anything about that. This is our first exposure to this term, second death. Now, I want you to hold on to that because you see it several times in the book of Revelation. And we're going to come back to this in a moment because you're going to see this at the end of this thousand years. So hang on to the term second death because you're going to see it again and what it really means. All right, so let's continue. Those that come up in the first resurrection, those that have been faithful and loyal to Jesus and God, they do not have any effects of this second death. It continues, 
but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So, we find out that the saved, which are resurrected, this must begin the, be the start of this thousand year period. Now, the Bible also talks about another resurrection found in Revelation 20, the same chapter we're studying about this thousand years, talks about two resurrections, actually. The first, and then it talks about a second one. Here it is, Revelation 20, verse 5. But the rest of the dead, this has to be talking about the lost. The first resurrection are the saved. We've made that very clear, as the Bible is taught on various occasions. The rest of the dead would then be those that have not been loyal and faithful and obedient to God. See, there's only two groups in the world. A lot of people think there's a, a righteous group or a saved group, and then the ultra-lost, you know, just the dregs of society. And then there's a great big gray area, kind of who knows what. But you know, you never find that in the Bible. Ever since the very beginning, ever since Cain and Abel, there's either been those with God or those against God. There's either those that are loyal to God and those that are not loyal to God. So even at the end of time, there's only two groups. Those that have been faithful and true and honest to God or those that haven't. So the ones that do not come up in the first resurrection have to be those that have turned away from God, rebelled against God, or even fought against God. They did not come to life, Revelation continues, until the thousand years were completed. Now Jesus talks about two resurrections. You can read this here in John 5, 28 and 29. For the hour is coming in which all that are in, their, in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life. Well, that would be the first resurrection, undoubtedly. And they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Jesus talks about two resurrections. Revelation itself talks about two resurrections. So as you begin to take a look at this, you begin to piece things together now. There are these two resurrections, and Revelation says that they are separated by this thousand-year period of time. It's like two bookends of this thousand-year period of time. The first resurrection, the second. Saved. No doubt about that. Second resurrection, Jesus calls it the resurrection of damnation. It must be dealing with those that are lost, that have not been true and faithful and obedient to Christ or the Father in heaven. Well, what do we do? Let's go and take a look at what the Bible says now as far as the events that begin the millennium. And there are really five. We've already looked at uh, one of them, and that's talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, we found out the other night that it's glorious, it's visible, it's, it's uh, joyous for those that have been waiting for Christ. It's audible. We can hear it. In other words, this coming is one of the events that starts this thousand-year period. What happens at the coming? We've already talked about it. The saved are resurrected. 1 Thessalonians 4, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God. That's the second coming. And the dead in Christ, they'll rise first. First resurrection. Well, what else happens during the beginning of this millennium? The saved, as we've already looked at on previous evenings, ascend to heaven. Let's go and take a look at it. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, Then we which are alive and remain, we're talking now about the saved. In other words, you and I, if Jesus were to come, we would be a generation that is alive. Then we which are alive, the faithful, and remain shall be caught up together with them. Who are the them? Well, those are the ones that have been raised in the first resurrection, the saved of all time. And all together, we meet the Lord in the air. What happens next? Number four, the lost are destroyed. We took a look at this on a couple of occasions. Some have the idea that after Jesus comes, life just continues as usual. You know, nothing really changes. Not so. The Bible tells it that the lost see him come, hear him come, experience his coming as well as the saved. But rather than having Jesus as their Savior, rather than having him as a Lord and having him come in great, great honor in their life, they're actually terrified 
The Bible says here in Isaiah, For behold, the Lord will come with fire, and with his chariots like a whirlwind, to render his anger with fury, and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. You also find this in the New Testament. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God, on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. You also find this in the Old Testament. This is a very a documented understanding that when Jesus comes, the saved are taken with him into heaven. The lost die upon the earth. Here's another one. Jeremiah 25, 33. And the slain of the Lord shall be that be a, at that day from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth they shall not be mourned nor gathered nor buried they shall be as dung on the earth now this sets the stage in Revelation now what happens to Satan up to this point it's dealing with humankind Jesus comes the humans that have accepted Christ down through the ages are resurrected. The ones that have not been loyal and true and been faithful to God or maybe fought against him, they do not come forth in that resurrection. They remain in their graves. This is where now we begin to talk about what happens to Satan. Where does he go? What does he do? Where is he during this thousand year period of time? Satan then is bound for a thousand years. How do you bind Satan? How do you take this angel, as we talked about, remember his name in the heavenly courts, because that's where he came from, his rebellion cast him to this earth, but his name was Lucifer. He was one of those guardian cherubs by the throne of God. Very powerful angel, exceedingly powerful. Uh, how do you bind some being like that? I mean, can you uh, put him in a straitjacket? Can you uh, put him in prison somewhere? Can you take him down to Alcatraz, you know? And can bars and concrete and steel keep this being in? No, you can't chain him by ordinary imprisonment, as we would think. He's a super being. So what is going on here? How is Satan bound? Let's find out. As we've already studied, the Bible tells us that all the saved of all the, all the uh, history of the earth are now with Christ. We found out that all the lost, whether they are alive when Jesus comes, they are slain, and the lost throughout the ages that have died already, they remain dead. So you have a phenomena going on here, and you've probably already picked up on this. The phenomena is very, very simple. Human population of the earth at this point, after Jesus comes, is zero. Zero. Remember, there's only two groups. There's the saved and the lost. The saved are with Christ. The lost are dead. That leaves no human beings on this planet. In fact, Satan is bound to this earth by a chain of circumstances. What do we mean by that? His rebellion against God comes to a stop since no people are left alive on the earth. For thousands of years, his goal has been to lead this planet in rebellion against God. To lead you and I, to lead the human family, to lead all of his demons and his fallen angels that, that rebelled with him. That has been his goal, to use this earth as an absolute launching pad of rebellion against God. Now all of a sudden, his whole regime and function of rebellion grinds to a stop. Why? There's nobody to lead in rebellion. He has his angels, but they've been with him ever since uh, heaven itself, before they were cast out. Now he is alone. He is now in solitary confinement. There is no human beings alive on the earth. As I said, all the righteous are with God. All the lost are dead. So now he is bound. He cannot lead a rebellion any longer. He is chained by the circumstances in which he finds himself in. Now what happens on earth than during the thousand years of Satan's solitary confinement? Good question. 
Let's go and find out. The Bible makes it very clear the condition of the earth during this thousand years. Some people will say, well, it just is like it is today. You know, it just keeps rolling on and everything's fine. You know, the seasons, the sun, blah, blah, blah. Well, notice something. I want you to share this text with me because this is a fascinating text. People have read this text and it just kind of flies right over their head. Jeremiah 4, 23. Jeremiah in vision now saw the world after the second coming of Jesus Christ. Remember, there are more texts in the Old Testament dealing with the second coming and beyond than there is with the uh, birth of Jesus as a baby in Bethlehem. So here Jeremiah is being given a vision very similar to what Daniel saw, very similar to what John saw, the one that wrote the book of Revelation. He sees now the world post Jesus coming. And I want you to notice what he says. I looked on the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens they had no light. Now why did I highlight without form and void? What is that talking about? Now, you might say to yourself, uh, I've heard that somewhere else, and you indeed have. If you go back to the very beginning of the Bible, to Genesis 1 verse 2, you're going to find that this is a phrase used to describe the world before Jesus, before Christ, uh, the pre-existent Christ, remember he is the creator, before he made life on earth. In the beginning was the world, the world was without form and void. You say, well, what does that mean? Uh, that's a Hebrew idiom, and uh, what it, the closest we can come to something that we can relate to in the English language is uncontrollable chaos. In other words, before life was, was created here on this world, this world was just a seething ball of uncontrollable matter. And no life, no light, nothing, just, just matter. And, uh, and that's how basically the Holy Spirit gave it to Moses when he wrote down here in Genesis 1. And the earth was like an uncontrollable seething mass of matter. There was no light. Remember the first day God made light. No light. No life. Nothing. Now it's interesting that that's how it describes the earth before creation. Now you find, and we just read it, Jeremiah 4.23, it says, I looked at the earth post Jesus coming, second time, and I saw the earth, it looked like it looked before creation even took place. It was that devastated. It was that devoid of life. It was an uncontrollable, chaotic mass of matter. Now, if you remember the other night, we talked about when Jesus comes. I mean, the, the crust of the earth disintegrates. Mountains fall into the earth. Islands are cast into the sea. Huge tsunamis ruin and wreck cities. The earthquake ruins the cities. The fruitful place, as we're going to read in a moment, becomes a wilderness. This world actually reverts back to the way it was prior to the creation of the world. It's amazing when you stop and think about this. Now you say, well, why'd you go into this? Here's why. Revelation 20, verse 2 says, And Satan was cast into the great abyss. Now, the word in Revelation 20, verse 2, that talks about abyss, it's on the screen there. It's a Greek word. You're getting to be quite Greek and uh, Hebrew scholars. Did you know that? The other night we taught you the word baptizo, meaning baptism. It simply means in the Greek to plunge underwater. Make clean by plunging underwater. Okay, then we found out the last time we were together, the Greek word for spirit is pneuma. Pneuma, it means breath or air. That's what it means. Now tonight I'm going to teach you another Greek word, abusos. Now can you say abusos? Come on, abusos, abusos. You know, I used to, uh, learning my, my Greek and Hebrew vocab, we call them vocab words or vocabulary words. And, and some of you, you just have to rote memorize. Of course you learn the alphabet and so forth and so on. But you know, learning the Greek, and by the way, the Greek is a dead language. I mean, the Koine Greek of the New Testament. Now, there's modern Greek. 
There's some similarity, but the Koine Greek that the New Testament was uh, written in is quite a dead language, and so it just takes rote memorization, and so I would walk around campus, you know, with my vocab words, and, and I, would, I would rap my vocab words. This was before rap was cool, and I'd go, abu sauce abyss, abu sauce abyss, abu sauce abyss. In other words, that's how I learned my vocab words. Now, the reason I'm telling you about abu sauce is because you can hear the word abyss in it. It's kind of the root word where we get abyss, abusos. What is the abusos? What is the abyss? It's this world. It's the world the way it is after the second coming, actually taking on the broken, uncontrollable, chaotic mass of matter that was there before even life was created on this world by God and by Christ. Amazing. Amazing as you begin to stop and think about it. In fact, let's go and read what Jeremiah has to say about this. Jeremiah 4, 25 and 26. I looked and behold, there was no man. And the birds of the heavens had fled. I looked and behold, the fruitful land was a wilderness. And all its cities were pulled down before the Lord, before his fierce anger. Jeremiah sees this world after Jesus' coming. There's no one on this world as far as a human being is concerned. There's no man. The wilderness is, is, is everywhere. Uh, the fruitful place is gone. It's just devastation. This is the abusos. This is the abyss that Satan is now imprisoned in. He cannot leave. There is no life on the planet. He is now chained by a set of circumstances. His rebellion grinds to a halt. It is absolutely solitary for Satan and his demons. Wow. What the Bible has to say about this is remarkable. Now, the question comes up, what happens in heaven during the thousand years? Well, that's a good question. Uh, that's where I'm going to be. How about you? Aren't you going to be there? Well, sure we are. Sure we are. We're all going to be there. I mean, that's our desire. You wouldn't be here tonight. If that wasn't your desire. So what in the world are we going to be doing up in heaven during this thousand years? And really, what is the purpose of this thousand years? I mean, eternity has started when, of course, Jesus comes back and the dead are resurrected and we all ascend up to the uh, heavens with him and ultimately to heaven itself. Uh, why doesn't that just begin it and be done with it? Let's go and find out. The Bible tells us, Revelation 20, verse 4, And I saw thrones... And they sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. Now, this is talking about us. The judgment, as far as saved and lost, that's gone. That's over. I mean, that's, when, that's what Jesus does. Remember, he pronounces judgment. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. That, that happened way back before his even second coming. And we studied that the other evening. So what is this talking about? The context, Revelation 20, is talking about during that thousand year period of time, judgment was given to them. Well, the them is referring to the saved. Well, what is this judgment all about? In fact, Paul talks about it. 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? What's this talking about? What do you mean the saints will judge the world? I thought judgment was over. Indeed, it has been. God's judgment is closed. The saved are saved. The lost are lost. So what are we judging? What are we judging even about angels? You know, when you get to heaven, you're going to have a lot of questions. I do. I, I have a whole list already written out. I'm going to ask God when I get there. Uh, why, why is it this way? And why was it that way? And what happened here and what happened there? I mean, don't you have your questions? Well, sure, we, we have a lot of questions. Many of my questions are going to be dealing with people. For instance, I'm going to get to heaven, and you will too, and you're going to look for somebody and maybe find out that that person isn't there. And uh, you're going to wonder. I wonder why they're not. They seem to be so good and so righteous. They seem to love God so much and... I just can't figure out why they're not here. On the other hand, you're going to find people there that you never believed would ever make it. In fact, you walk down the street maybe one day and you'll see this, you're here? How'd you get here? I mean, you're going to be shocked. 
You're just going to be shocked. Let me give an example of what I'm talking about. The other night we talked about a man by the name of Stephen. Now Stephen was this preacher, this, uh, actually the Bible calls him a, a, a deacon. And he was the one that preached to the Jewish leadership. Remember that? Acts 6 and 7? Uh, a tremendous sermon on Jesus Christ, except Christ. Well, they rejected not only his message, they rejected the messenger, which is very typical. They took Stephen out and stoned him. You remember the story, all right? The man that was in charge of the stoning, his name was Saul. And we found out the other night, of course, on the road to Damascus, he was converted. His name was changed from Saul to Paul. You know the story. So here is Stephen now. He is looking at a man by the name of Saul. And the last thing he sees in this life is Saul sneering at him. Me egging on those that are stoning, holding their coats. Give it to him. Give it to him. Give it to him. All right. Stephen dies. Now, Jesus comes. Saul, in the meantime, after Stephen's death, has been converted, became a wonderful apostle of Christ, be it was used by God to reach actually billions of people since the writings of the New Testament. So here's Stephen. He has no idea that happened. So here he is. He's walking down heaven, and uh, he sees Paul, who he thinks in his mind, whoa! There Saul, the persecutor of the Christians. He killed me. He was the one that was instrumental. And, and Stephen's going to go, whoa, has there been a mistake here? Don't you think he'll think that? Sure. He's going to say, why is he here? What would you think if you got to heaven, Billy Graham was absent, and Adolf Hitler was there? Now, what would you think? You'd think, whoa. Something has really gone wrong. So what are you going to do? You're going to go to God. You're going to say, okay, I have a question. Now remember, questioning is not sinning. We found that out the other night. He gave you a mind. He gave you reason. He, he, he wants you to ask questions. And so you go to him and say, Lord, my next door neighbor... Uh, I, I knew of him in history as Stalin. And he's my next door neighbor. What's going on? And I'm looking for my preacher and he's not here. What's going on? Now, I, I want to make it very clear. You know, maybe some uh, just woke up and I, I don't want to give anybody the impression that Stalin's going to be in heaven, all right? I don't know. I'm not the judge. This is an illustration, okay? Because there's going to be some people that you never thought would make it are going to be there, and people you thought for sure would be there aren't going to be there. By the way, are you aware some people will be surprised to see you in heaven? <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> Whoa. Well, anyway, so what are you going to do? You're going to God, what's going on? What's going on? Now, God could say, be quiet. Hush up. He could. Okay. But you know what? I wonder if God really treated this thing fair. Remember, questioning pursued too far leads to doubt. Why? Well, I just wonder. I wonder. That's what started in the first place. God's not going to say, be quiet. Don't you trust me? He's going to say, I want you to know. I'm going to take you into the record rooms. We are going to go there, and we're going to see that individual's life. As you've never seen it, you're going to see it as I saw it. You're going to read his or hers heart. For the first time, as you take a look at some of those that maybe you thought should have been there, you're going to see they led a double life. You're going to see they led a very sinful life, a closet sinful life. Oh, they maybe looked righteous on the outside. Oh, maybe they came to church and said the right things. But down deep, they were against God. Down deep, they, they didn't want to serve God hypocritical. You didn't know that. In other words, God will show you the record, and you're going to come back, and you're going to say, whoa, I didn't know that. Why, look at this person that I thought for sure wouldn't be here. Why, he gave his heart to you later, maybe when I didn't even know it. Oh, Lord, you are just and true. You see, God wants us to settle, even us the saved. 
God wants to settle in our minds that every act of judgment that has taken place is absolutely correct and just. You see, if you have a question as far as God's justice is concerned, if you even have a doubt that maybe he didn't deal with this person or that person quite right, if you even have that even inkling of doubt, then this whole process of rebellion can start again. God says it's never going to start again. Not everybody is going to be absolutely satisfied that I handled every single case just and true. Well, what happens at the end of that thousand year period of time? Well, the Bible said it already, and we read it, the lost are then resurrected. Revelation 20 verse 5, but the rest of the dead, that has to be of course those that have been against God in their life here on earth, the lost did not come to life until the thousand years were completed or finished. Well, we go back to our little chart. Remember these two resurrections are like bookends. The first resurrection would be the resurrection to eternal life. The second resurrection, as Jesus calls it, the resurrection to damnation, or the resurrection to eternal death. What happens next? Satan is loosed from his solitary imprisonment. Where do we find that? It's right here in Revelation 27 and 8. And when the thousand years are completed, or finished, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations. What does it mean, released from his prison? The resurrection of the lost, the second resurrection has happened. The lost of all eternity have been resurrected. They're alive now. Satan now has a human element, a human force to lead once again in rebellion against God. He comes out of his prison house, the circumstances of his solitary confinement. The earth now has billions of people on it. They are all the ones that have all been against God. Think about it. Pure, unadulterated evil from a Satan's viewpoint, his demon's viewpoint, and from humanity's viewpoint. Not one righteous, no, not one on the earth at this time. He rushes into these and deceives them that actually he is the one that brought them back to life. He is the Lord. He isn't cloaked now. He unveils himself in all his evil splendor. I am the one that you have worshipped. I am the one that gave you life. We are now going to war and take our rebellion right to the throne of God. And this is what Revelation says. At this point, God's throne within the new Jerusalem comes down to, from heaven to earth. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. At this point, Jesus descends ahead of the holy city. This is where Zechariah 14 verse 4 talks about how his feet touch the Mount of Olives. And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in the front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from the east to west by a very large valley so that half of the mountain will move toward the north and the other half toward the south. This is where a huge plain develops where the city of God actually comes and rests upon the earth. Now the big showdown has come. This is the ultimate, ultimate, ultimate showdown between Christ and Satan between light and darkness, between good and evil. And you begin to see it here because you find that the lost are rallied by Satan to actually storm and take the city of God. And they, the lost, came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. It has always been Satan's goal to be God. In fact, that's one of the things of his rebellion. He wasn't content any longer to be an angel by the throne of God. He wanted worship. He wanted to be God. He wanted to dethrone God and sit in God's place. In fact, you find this in Isaiah. This is Lucifer talking about his goals as far as his rebellion is concerned. Isaiah 14, 14, I'll climb to the top of the clouds. I'll take over as king of the universe. 
He's always wanted God's position ever since his rebellion. Now the holy city and inside the city is his throne. Now God, Christ, the Spirit, all the righteous, the saints, all the saved of all ages, they're all there. That has now come down to this earth. All the lost that have ever lived are alive on the face of the earth. Every human being that has been loyal to God is alive inside the city. This is a big showdown. Everybody who has ever lived is alive at this time. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason for this ultimate showdown between righteousness and evil, between rebellion and truth. Well, what happens? As the city is surrounded, all of a sudden a panorama takes place. Everybody sees the part they played either for God or against God. Whether you're inside the city or outside the city, you see your life flashed in front of your face. You see how you supported and were loyal and true to the Lord God. How you reverenced him and loved him and honored him. Those outside the city see their life as a fight against God. How they hated God. How they despised God. Everybody sees very clearly the part they played in this great controversy between Christ and Satan. The Bible says at this point, Romans 14, 11, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. Even the lost, even Satan himself, recognize as this huge panorama has taken place, everyone recognizes God's justice. Uh, you see, it's not just simply enough for us within the city to be satisfied God is true, just, and righteous. I mean, that's very important. Because throughout eternity, we're the ones that will continue to live in harmony with God. But God also wants to make it very clear to the ones that are lost why they are lost. He has given them appeal after appeal after appeal for thousands of years. Why will you die? Won't you turn back to me? They will see absolutely positively their anger, their hatred against God. They will recognize they hate him. But they are forced as they see this whole thing display, they're forced to recognize, yes, God, you are true. Now, does this mean that, you know, the gates of the city swing open and all the lost come on in? No. They admit to the justice and vindication of God. But their hearts, of course, are not changed. They still hate God. At this point in time, as every human being on earth has vindicated and made it very clear, yes, God, your government is true and just. Whether you're in the city or out the city. At this point in time, the Bible says in Revelation, Revelation 20, verse 9, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. Those would be those outside the city. Some people say there is no hell fire. Well, there is hellfire. The Bible makes it very clear, though, that hellfire isn't burning now. The Bible tells us that this fire that the Bible describes as hellfire takes place at this point in time. After the Holy City comes down, after this huge, great showdown, after everybody, whether inside the city or outside the city, have recognized that God's judgment and God's vindication is true. That's when hellfire comes. Notice it says devoured them. I told you to hang on to something and that is that the Bible says this is the, what are the next two words? Second death. Aha! Now we talked about that. Remember the Bible tells us very clearly Revelation 20, verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Of course, those are the saved. On such, the second death, you could say hellfire, has no power. 
Second death. Second death. What does that mean? All right. The lost have already died once. They were resurrected at the end of the thousand years. Now the fire falls and they die again the second time. That's what it means. Their second death. Now some people have the idea where well, they just keep on living somewhere. Maybe they're in torment. Maybe they're in agony. Maybe they're burning. Well, the Bible kind of paints a different picture. And I'm kind of glad for this. Some people have the idea that God is in the torture business. That God has some medieval, horrible torture chamber. Worse than anything we can ever imagine. But that is not what the Bible says. I want to read a few passages about this. 2 Peter 3, verse 10. The heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with great heat. And the earth and its works will be burned up. Peter here is talking about the ultimate destruction of sin, sinners, and the lost. It's going to be burned up. They are devoured. The Bible calls it a second death. But there's more. The second death of the lost is just what it says. It is death. And you can read it here. Wicked shall not perish, and they, they, they'll be oh, consumed away into smoke. They're going to be reduced to ashes over and over and over. It talks about the, what we call hellfire. It denotes it as an absolute end, death of the lost. In fact, let's read another text or two on this. We can find out where the Bible says in Ezekiel 28, 16, and 18, I will destroy you, O covering cherub. This is talking about Satan, Lucifer himself. Therefore, I will bring fire from the midst of you. It shall consume you, and I will bring you to ashes. Where? Upon the earth. This fire falls, consumes the lost, even Satan himself, here on this world. Hellfire is not burning now somewhere. Hellfire comes at the end of this thousand years and it completely destroys once and for all Satan, sinners. It destroys absolutely completely the demons. Sin is no more. Now some people have the idea that this is a, you know, a torture chamber that you go to, that you burn. You know, if that's the case, if, if God is that type of a God, to where, let's say, let's say you're a bad person, all right? Let's say you live, let's say you live 25 years, all right? But you're a horrible person, you know, let's say that. I mean, you're vile. You hate God. Yeah, you know, you do all sorts of, of horrible things. All right, you live 25 years. So God comes along and says, all right, for 25 years of sin and rebellion... I am going to roast and barbecue and torture you for trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions. Why, even in our humanity, we would say that is unjust. Are you aware that a lot of people have left Christianity because of this idea that somehow God will keep you alive to torture you? Now think about this. God is the giver of life. He is the sustainer of life. So if you are somewhere, you have to be sustained to live. And if you are living, you are living for the pleasure of God to torture you. I mean, what kind of a God do you serve? Think about it. Think about it. That's not what the Bible says at all. When this happens, it's over. The suffering, the pain, it's over. They do not suffer in torment. They die, as the Bible says. They're reduced to ashes. They are gone. No misery, no suffering, no agony that lasts. It's a merciful thing God does to those who have absolutely chosen, beyond any question of any doubt, to support and love and be a part of his eternal kingdom. Here's another one. For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff. And the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. Satan, of course, would be the root of all evil. Branches, of course, would be the followers. And you will tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day which I am preparing. I mean, you see this all over the Bible. 
Everywhere you look about this, it's talking about a finality. It's over. By the way, if you have Satan and his followers, his demons, if you have them even in a torture chamber somewhere, but if they're still alive, then the sin issue still has not been resolved. Sin still exists. Now the Bible says, after this point, there will be zero sin in the universe. Wow. So it's impossible to have sinners or even Satan in some type of an agony or torture because sin would still be in the universe. No, it's going to be gone. It's wiped away. It's purged. It's done. It's over. Well, we find out other things. Jesus, in fact, the most famous text in all the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not. What's the next word? Perish. What happens when you perish? You die. It's exactly what Revelation says. By the way, nowhere in the Bible has God promised the lost everlasting life. He's never promised the lost everlasting life. If you have them living forever, even in a burning torment type of a situation, they also have eternal life. You never find that in the Bible. It's the saved, the loyal, those who love God and have given their heart to Him. They are the ones that have eternal life. The lost perish. They're dead. They're gone. It's over. They don't live in agony. They don't experience this torture. You know, again, I don't think I would be a Christian if that's really what the Bible says. I couldn't serve a God that would absolutely be such a tyrant, such a vengeful to treat people like that. No, God says in his mercy, it's over, they're done, they're gone. No torture, no suffering. Praise God that that is the way it's going to be. In fact, Genesis 19:24 is a little picture of this hellfire. You know, all through the Bible, we have these little pictures. We have a little picture of the lamb, the cross, the judgment in the Old Testament, judgment to come, second coming, you know, uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, you know, the end of the world. You always have these little pictures. Here's one that even the New Testament uses as a picture of hellfire. It's when Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. Then the Lord rained down upon Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from God out of heaven. How do we know this is a little picture, an example of hellfire? We find it in the New Testament, Jude 7. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited it means it's, it's an example as one, an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Now you say, well, Dan, 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 well, look, 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 look. Um, it's eternal fire. That means it burns forever, right? No. Is Sodom and Gomorrah still burning tonight? I've taken a lot of uh, tours over there. And, uh, you know, usually if I lead a tour in Israel, and I've done a few of those, I will give you homework the night before. We'll meet in the hotel lobby or somewhere, and I'll say, okay, tomorrow we're going to visit here, here, and here. And then on, under each of the sites, I will list down there all the Bible passages that took place where we're going to go. You know, I don't want you to get there. You know, the, the bus rolls up, and uh, we get out, and I say, well, now we are here at En Gedi. And you go, what happened at En Gedi? No, I don't want you to do that. I want you to say, whoa, this is where David hid in the cave. This is where Saul, you know, where David cut off the hem of his garment. There's a beautiful spring there. Uh, there's a lot of caves in the mountain. And also other things happened there. Various battles took place there. And I, I want you to know what's going on. All right, I've never gotten my group together, uh, you know, the night before the next day tour. And I, I say, okay, tomorrow, everybody, we're going to go down to Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, you know, the fire is still going down there. And it's pretty hot, so you better wear some shorts, you know, better wear some uh, light clothing. Uh, bring your uh, uh, marshmallows and weenies, you know, we might want to roast a little bit down there. Uh, I don't do that. Why? Because Sodom and Gomorrah, the fire, is gone. It did, listen now, the fire did an eternal work. The fire destroyed it 
eternally. It suffered the punishment of eternal destruction. That's what it's talking about there. In fact, we find this also in 2 Peter 2, verse 7. He condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to, what's the word there? Ashes. Now, ashes is a result of fire when it goes out. Same with Lucifer. He's going to be reduced to ashes. Same with his followers. Reduced to ashes. The fire goes out. There is no lingering agony and suffering. Not at all. Having made them, the Bible continues here, an example to those who would live ungodly. So you begin to find out very clearly that this is talking about a final, ultimate death of the lost. Now some people say, but then, but then, but then, somewhere in the Bible, somewhere, somewhere, somewhere it says that they burn forever and ever. And the smoke of their torment, here it is, Revelation 14, 11, the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. What does that mean? Well, let's go and find out. What does the term forever and ever mean in the Bible? I want to take you to the book of Exodus. We're going to discover now what this term forever and ever means. Exodus 21, verse 6, gives us an example. Now this is talking about servants and masters. Uh, this is one of those things, that, kind of like a, a law of the land. And I want to read it because the term forever is used here in a context. And you're going to see how a Middle Eastern, how a, a mind that, uh, you know, lived back in those days, what they termed as forever. Here it is. Then his master shall bring him to the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or the doorpost. What is this talking about? Really quick. Let's say an individual was an indentured servant. You know what an indentured servant is? They have made an agreement to work for somebody for so many years. You take care of me, you feed me, you house me, and I'll work for you for five years, eight years, seven years, whatever it might be. At the end of that time, the individual has worked his freedom. All right? Let's say, however, that one of these indentured servants decide that they want to stay on they enjoy working for this family or for this, uh, this person. And they want to remain in his employment. They want to remain a servant under him. This is what it's talking about. All right? If that's the case, they'll bring this individual to the judges, to the door, the doorpost. And his master shall pierce his ear with an awl. In other words, he'd put a sign. He'd put a hole in it uh, and, and some type of an insignia, like a little earring or something that he belongs to this certain man, whoever it might be. He has chosen to cement his life to that man and his family. And the Bible continues, now listen, when a person does this, he shall serve him how long? What does the Bible say there? Forever. Now are those indentured servants still serving those, you know, masters? No. They all died. But as long as life lasted, they served him. The Bible understanding of forever and ever is, here it is, as long as a person lives. I'm going to serve God forever. How long is that? As long as I live. That's the connotation of forever and ever. Here's another one. Let me tell you about this one. This is Hannah. She, uh, she was a woman in Israel. She was barren. She didn't have any children. She asked God to give her a son. If God gave her a baby, she would give this baby ultimately to God. He would grow up in the temple. He would serve God. I mean, that was her pledge if, she would, uh, if, if God would ever uh, answer her prayer and give her a child. So let's pick up the story. 1 Samuel 1.22 I will not go up until the child be weaned. God answered her prayer. By the way, this was the mother of Samuel. And then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. So Hannah, Samuel's mother, prays to God, if you'll give me a child, I'll dedicate him to you and I will send him to appear before you forever. Well, is Samuel still in Jerusalem serving God? No, he died. But as long as he lived, he served God. Now, how do we know this? How do we know that the word forever means as long as he lives or as long as life lasts? Here it is. 
The very next first, uh, verse or two, 1 Samuel one twenty eight. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord as long as he liveth. Forever, as long as he liveth. Forever, as long as life shall last. In other words, the term forever and ever is a biblical expression which means as long as a person lives. The idea that God is going to somehow sustain life so that he can torture life is not biblical at all. They are destroyed. Once their life is over, then uh, eternity and sin and sinners is clean. Well, let's go to our chart real quick. We see our day. We're living right before the coming. No one knows the day or the hour of Jesus' coming. We need to be ready today. Don't get ready. Be ready. Be in tune with Christ. Commit your life in wholeness to Him. He returns. First resurrection takes place. We find out that that's when all the wonderful, marvelous uh, contortions of the earth take place. The earth takes the appearance of the earth even before creation. The earth is desolate. All the righteous are with Christ. All the lost are dead. Satan is here alone. He's in solitary confinement. He can't leave. He can't lead anybody in rebellion because there's zero human population on earth. At the end of the thousand years, the holy city descends. The second resurrection, all the lost are resurrected. Now when the holy city comes and the second resurrection of the lost takes place, every human being that's ever been alive on the face of the earth, the great big showdown takes place. All people of all time recognize and vindicate God's justice. Remember this whole struggle between Christ and Satan is on who is just and right. And until the human family, everyone, recognizes that God's judgment and God's government is just and true, that and only then is the universe going to be safe. We also find that God doesn't take any joy in the destruction of the lost. 2 Peter 3 verse 9 says, The Lord is long-suffering toward us, not will willing that any should perish. Some have the idea that God is going to be gleeful over this. He's not. It's the inevitable. They have chosen to absolutely hate Him. Some have even suggested, and there might be something to this, that God is the giver of all life. He has done everything He can during their earthly life to reach their heart. The Spirit of God, the Bible tells us, speaks to every person on earth, wooing them, talking to them, moving in their life. Some people call it a conscience. You know, I think it's really more of the Holy Spirit. What's right? What's wrong? What's true? What's false? He strives with everyone. And if they are determined to turn against Him, and every opportunity has been given them to return. Basically, God removes himself from that part of his creation. You know, some have even referred to, maybe he even turns his back. The life line ceases, and they are consumed by their own sin. He doesn't have any joy in that. In fact, he says over and over, I don't want any of my children to perish. He also says this in Ezekiel 33, 11, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die? You know, the angels in heaven, you know, they must, they must just be dumbfounded. Why would anyone not choose to love and serve a merciful, gracious, heavenly Father? It must boggle their imagination. Why would we persist to live in the swill and sewer of sin? And Jesus, the Spirit, the Father say, why? Why will you pursue this? So don't ever get the idea that God is gleeful, that somehow when hellfire falls that he's happy. 
He's probably even weeping over the persistent hatred of those people against him. However, when the fire goes out, and it will, this doesn't burn forever, they are reduced to ashes, there's no long-term agony and suffering and pain, God is not a torturer, but when the fire falls, the fire consumes, and the fire goes out, then the Bible says he recreates a new world. He takes this world, even what it might look before creation, and he recreates a brand new world for you and for me. Revelation 20, 21 verse 5, And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Can you imagine being a part of that creation? I would have given anything to, to have been able to, to watch God create this world in the very beginning, but we will be able to watch him recreate it. We'll go and get our, our uh, you know, lawn chairs out of our mansions and put them on the wall. Say, okay, God, let's see what you can do. And he'll say, okay, gather around, my children. Whoosh! There goes oceans and whoosh! There goes mountains and whoosh! There goes an atmosphere. Beautiful things. New things. Untainted with death and sin and disease and pain and disappointment. Can you imagine that? We will witness the creative act of God. Some time ago, a reporter was in Chicago. He was going to go and cover a story. He got in late, went down to, they call downtown Chicago, there's a, they call it the Loop, and there's some big skyscrapers down there, a lot of hotels down there. He got in late, and uh, he checked into his hotel. He was given a room way up at the top stories, way above the street. Of course, it was late. He was exhausted from his flight, so he just flopped in bed, went to sleep. A few hours later, the fire alarms went off in this hotel. I've been in a hotel on fire, and uh, you know, these alarms are unbelievably loud. I mean, you cannot stand to be in that hotel with those alarms going because they are just excruciating. Somehow, some way, this man woke up, realized this hotel must be on fire. By the way, they have a, a voice, an uh, automated voice. This is not a drill. This is an actual emergency. And uh, please go to the immediate exit. And I I've heard that. This man went to the window. He saw evidently the, the, the engines uh, forming down, way down there at the bottom of the uh, street. He got an idea. He decided he was going to call the editor of his news organization and tell him what was going on. Somehow he got on his phone the editor in the distant town where he had come from, and somehow he began to communicate with this editor with all the commotion going on that he was in such and such a hotel, and that hotel is now on fire. He hadn't hit the news because, you know, it just was going on now. His editor said, get out now. Leave. Escape. He says, no. He says, I'm going to tell you what it's like inside. All the other news organizations are going to tell you what it's like on the outside. I'm on the inside. I'm going to tell you what it's like. The editor said, you're crazy. Get out now. I know when I'm going to get out. Don't worry. I'll get out. I know the last moment I'll be able to make it. Don't worry about me. He began to describe what was going on, how people were coming out of the upper stories that were even above him, cramming into the stairwells, older people being pushed and shoved and fallen, children screaming and yelling and families being separated and people tumbling down the staircase. He, he talked about how the elevator, people went in the elevator, not supposed to in a fire. The elevator ran a few times and all of a sudden the elevator jammed. He could hear the elevator a few floors down, jammed, stuck, people beating, screaming, yelling inside the elevator. The fire kept getting higher and higher and higher, the heat and the smoke. He began to describe how people would actually try to jump from the roof across the street. I mean, people, when they panic and they get crazed, they, they don't think straight. There's no way you can jump across the street from one rooftop to the other, but yet... That's all they thought about is jumping across the street. They would just jump a few feet, of course, out and fall to their death. Horrible things were happening. And it was telling what it's like inside the screams and the agonies. Finally, he told his editor, he said, if I don't get out now, I'm not going to get out. 
I know exactly my route of escape. He went to that escape route. It was blocked. Evidently, he ran back into his room, knowing that he was trapped, knowing that he could not leave and get away the way he thought he could. So evidently, somehow, some way, he maybe threw some furniture through the window because the window broke, and somehow he got the attention of one of the firemen way down on the street that was battling the blaze. He was waving. The firemen recognized that there was somebody still alive up there. They thought that if everybody had gotten out, that could have gotten out, the ones that were left were dead. The ladders couldn't reach that high. The, the firemen had tried to go to the upper stories. They couldn't get there. The fire was so hot and blocked their way. But here was a man. He was still alive. They got the bullhorn. They, they said, your only hope is the net. He was way up there. Many, many, many stories. They spread the net. The bullhorn, jump. We'll catch you. The man stepped out to the window, and he jumped. But the fall was so long and so far that he drifted and missed the net and died on the streets of Chicago. You say, why did you tell us that story? Well, a lot of people are doing that. A lot of people I've met through the years, maybe even some here, So, oh, Dan, don't worry. I know all the signs of the coming. Oh yeah, I know all the events. I have my charts. I can plot this, plot that, and I know exactly what's going on. Yeah, I know I'm not quite right with Christ. Oh yeah, I'm not following up to everything I know to be right. Oh yeah, I know that, but, but don't worry about me because you know when, when things really start getting to the end and I can see it on my chart, then, then I'll, I'll get right. Then I'll jump. Then I will have my way of escape. But you know what? When that time comes, it'll be too late. You see, today is the day we make the decision to make and keep our hearts right with Christ. You don't wait into the future. You don't wait till this big event happens or that sign that maybe Revelation talks about. Today, you make the decision to walk in everything you know to be true and correct with Christ. Don't put it off. Don't put it off. A lot of people are doing that. But it's dangerous to do that. Things will happen in such rapid succession that people will be caught off guard and before you know it, they will recognize it's too late. If you see truth, follow truth now. Don't wait. Don't put it off. Say, well, maybe next week or next year or two years from now, then I'll follow it. Do it now. Now is the accepted time, the Bible says. Now is the day of salvation. What a joy it is to see a lot of people right here in this community coming together. Some are making decisions. Making decisions for Christ. Making decisions for baptism and rebaptism. What a thrill that is. But I really encourage everyone, if you've never made that commitment, to go and follow Christ in all things, that you'll just simply let go. Let go and let Jesus, let Jesus have his beautiful way in your life. Let's pray together tonight. Father in heaven, as we have come together again tonight to study the Bible, you know, we look at these prophecies and, and we see the amazement of how it all fits together. We see how the judgment and the coming and how now this thousand years and the ultimate destruction of the lost, we see it painting a picture. Oh Lord, we want to be ready when Jesus comes. We're living at a time in which the world is moving rapidly toward a great appearing of Christ and we just pray, Lord, that we will be part of those people. As we have gathered together tonight, Lord, I know everyone here really, really loves you. They wouldn't have made such an effort to come if they don't have a real connection with you. And so, Lord, just give us the mind and the heart of Jesus to walk in truth, all the truth that we know. Embrace it. Love it. Live it. Oh, Father, please. 
pour your spirit out as our heads are bowed in prayer and every eye is closed. How many of you would like to just with me, my heart is responding to this, how many of you would like to say, Lord Jesus, I want to follow you in all the truth of the word of God that I know to be right. Would you raise your hand? I want to follow all the truth that I know to be right. I might not know some truth, but what I do know, I want to follow. I want to be true. Raise your hand. My hand is up, and I hope every hand will be raised tonight. Lord, you see our determination to follow you. We don't want to follow the commandments of men or the tradition of men. We want to follow Christ and his word. And bless us, Lord. Give us the courage to do that. Give us the Holy Spirit and enable us to live the truth. We give you the praise for all of that. We know we can't do it of our own selves. But you living within, we can. We thank you and we, we pray this prayer in the precious and holy name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.